Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. Tonight's event is part of the African Strategic Forum at the Institute of World Politics. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our coordinator and moderator for tonight's event, Professor Hashem Meki. Thank you so much, uh, Hannah, for uh, introduction and uh, thank you for uh, uh, helping coordinate this uh, event. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone uh, who has uh, been able to tune in for this important topic that we would uh, discuss for the day. And I'm glad to uh, see that uh, a lot of people have signed up. My name is Hashim Meki, as Hannah has said, and I will be your moderator for the day. I'm an adjunct Arabic professor of Arabic media and communication in the Arabic language at the Institute. I also coordinate and direct and moderate this uh, event, which is called African Strategic uh, Forum that brings uh, issues of importance and of strategic uh, importance to the African continent, the, the geopolitics. So I'm very happy and honored that we have uh, two phenomenal uh, guests today who would uh, talk to the issue of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And uh, for those who might wonder why we chose this topic, and uh, this is because this issue is really of uh, great, great of strategic importance to the to the region. And uh, particularly to the Horn of Africa. And it has created a tense relationship uh, between Ethiopia on one hand, and also Egypt and Sudan, uh, one of the two uh, countries uh, in the downstream uh, of the Nile. As many of you might know, Ethiopia has built uh, the dam at a cost of uh, 4.9 billion uh, US dollars. And in the past few months, both sides, meaning Ethiopia and, and Egypt, uh, relationship have become tense. And uh, this is particularly of uh, concern and issue that we have our expert here to uh, help us uh, figure out. Now, the uh, press, as many of you might have followed, have reported uh, cyber attacks against Ethiopian economic uh, interests targeting, uh, and this alleged uh, you know, reports that this could have been from Egypt and vice versa. Anyway, this is taking place against the backdrop of the failed American mediation. As uh, many might know, America has tried to mediate in this conflict, uh, which it has stalled. But at the moment, African Union mediation uh, is taking place. In this, the issue at heart is uh, what time period should the Ethiopian uh, be able to fill the dam without guarantees and concessions demanded by, uh, by Cairo and Khartoum? Uh, it's uh, two uh, downstream neighboring countries. What I will ask as a moderator is, uh, as I said, that this is an important issue. So I would like as a moderator that the two great panelists we have today uh, engage in offering their uh, policy proposals in a manner that is more constructive and that so that uh, the audience online, Facebook and YouTube, uh, would get a chance to understand that this uh, contentious issue and hope that we could reach some uh, proposal uh, for policy resolution of this uh, issue that has uh, uh, impacted uh, the region. So with that, I will introduce first uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hani Swellam, uh, who is uh, a professor of hydrology and water resources management at the RWTH. Aachen University in Germany. So he's calling us from Germany. So thank you for being here. He is currently the managing director of the UNESCO chair in hydrological uh, chains and water resources management at the RWTH Aachen. He is also a professor at the American University in Cairo. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor uh, Suelem. Uh, second, I will introduce uh, my other panelist, Dr. Uh, Simo Morges, who has a bachelor of science in hydraulic engineering and master's of science and PhD in water resources engineering and has an over 20 years of extensive experience in teaching, research and consultancy in the area of hydrological modeling, 
water resources planning and management and climate change. Mr. Morgis has taught in many universities in Ethiopia and abroad. He has coordinated and been involved in many regional and national projects and programs related to the Nile Basin. So please uh, help me in welcoming these two distinguished experts to lead us in this discussion. And with that, without further ado, I will introduce uh, my uh, first panelist, Mr. Uh, Morgis, to uh, start presenting uh, his remarks. So please welcome. Yeah, thank you, Professor Mackey. Can you share? Uh, can I share the my screen? Absolutely. You have access to that. You have fifteen minutes, so please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Excuse me, ma'am. Bear with us, uh, audience, please, as we figure out the technicalities of uh, showing the uh, PowerPoint. Thank you. Okay, finally. Can you see? Almost there. Uh, how about now? It says, yes, you have started sharing your screen. Is it shared now? I cannot see it, but uh, how about Dr. Uh, yeah, I don't see it. It's saying it's saying started sharing, but it's not showing. It's it's not showing yet. Wow. Do you want to have uh, Mr. Uh, Swelm go first? Okay, that's better. Okay, Doctor uh, Hani, please go first if you. Uh, if you have your slides right. Uh, you can just just stop sharing so that they can uh, share my screen. Uh, okay. So. Do you see my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay, good. So I am going to introduce the, the issue of the GERD from the Egyptian perspective and trying to highlight possible impacts on Egypt from uh, the dam. Um, I was asked it, uh, yeah, that we have general audience, so I'm not gonna be very technical. Could just give you uh, some figures, some pictures, very light uh, uh, technical issues. And then, of course, whatever type of questions you have, you can ask whether it's more general or technical. And we'll be very happy to answer all your points. So um, the, about the current situation in Egypt or the water situation in Egypt, as you can see, I mean, it's very clear that uh, the entire country, I mean, more than 93% of the country is a desert. And this is the River Nile that you see going from the south to the north. And only this green strip of the country that all the Egyptians are living around or surrounding the two sides of the River Nile, which comes from 
the south here to the Mediterranean Sea in the north. So only this green area that accommodates 105 million inhabitants. So we're leaving all of this area and living around the river because this is a source of life for the Egyptians. So uh, Egypt is identified as the driest country in the world as according to the FAO in 2012. Uh, the total renewable water resources is 58.3 billion cubic meter. And uh, you can imagine 55.5 out of this amount is coming from the River Nile. The other uh, uh, very little amount is coming from the little rainfall that's normally on the north coast, close to the Mediterranean Sea here, and some of the groundwater available in the country. So the dependency of Egypt on the river is 97%. That's, that's the important to know. Um, the share per capita is 560 to 570 cubic meter per year. So each person has a share of 570 cubic meter. And of course, you know, or most of you, you know that the water poverty line is 1000 cubic meter per capita per year. So the Egyptians are living far below the water poverty line. So they are almost uh, have water shortage of 50% of what's needed in the country to reach the water poverty, not even to exceed it. Um, the annual water shortage in Egypt is 25 billion cubic meter, and that's what makes Egypt is the biggest export uh, importer of wheat to feed the population because there is no enough water to grow all the needed crops. So Egypt, that's why, is importing more than 60% of its food. So these are some facts about the current water situation in Egypt. If we move to the Nile Basin itself, as you can see here, this is the Nile Basin that's colored here in the middle. And you can see here that the total amount of precipitation over the Nile Basin is 7,000 billion cubic meter per year. And 1,660 billion cubic meter uh, is inside this basin, but the 7,000 mentioned is falling on the 11 Nile Basin countries. So what Egypt is receiving here in the north of the continent is less than 1% of the amount of water falling on the Nile Basin countries and less than 3% of the amount of water falling in the basin itself, the colored one. So um, if you can see here, for example, this dark color, as you can see, um, is receiving 2,500 millimeter per year. And in the north, in Egypt, is only about 18 millimeter, one eight. Um, although this very intensive rainfall in Ethiopia, of course, there are some periods of drought. As you can see here, this is a picture from Ethiopia. And it shows that the people are trying to collect their water because of the drought period. But this is also a picture in Egypt in which people are searching for water. And honestly, both of them, they hurt us. They hurt us to see this picture in Ethiopia, but it hurt us also to see that picture in Egypt. So um, when you see it in the newspaper, you have to distinguish between the two pictures. So it's not always water scarcity. Scarcity is not only uh, a water scarcity. You have to identify the type of scarcity. And this is the map that was published by the FAO in 2019 showing the difference between scarcity. So if you go to Egypt here, the water scarcity in Egypt is physical water scarcity, which means that the water is not available. The water is not there. But the water scarcity in Ethiopia, which we admit that there is a period of drought, uh, is more an economic water scarcity, which means that uh, the, the, it's caused by the lack of investment in water or lack of human capacity to satisfy uh, the demand for water, even in places like here in Ethiopia, in the case of Ethiopia, where water is abundant. So this is a huge difference between the two country, countries that needs to be recognized first. So moving to the current situation and where is the GERD and what is the GERD and why it's a problem for uh, uh, of discussion and why this issue is a very hot issue. What you see here are the three countries, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. And you can see here, this is Lake Victoria. 
The White Nile is flowing up to Khartoum, and there is a dam here from Sudan, Jabal Awliya, and then there is Lake Tana here, a Bay River, or the Blue Nile, the, the one in, the, in our focus of this night, and then you have here Rosera's Dam. You can see Rosera's Dam is very close to the border of Ethiopia, and then you have Sinar Dam, and then both dams, they meet in Khartoum, the, 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 the main uh, uh, city in, in Sudan, or the capital of Sudan, and then the river flows further to Egypt, and there is a big dam here. It's called High Aswan Dam. This is a point in, at which Ethiopia is building the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Why this point is important for the people in Egypt? Because this point is responsible for up to 60% of the amount of water reaching Egypt. So we discussed already that Egypt is dependent on the river by 97% of its water resources. And this specific point is responsible for up to 60%. You can say 59%, 58%. But we can say up to 60% is coming from this specific point. That's why the GERD itself is a vital story and very sensitive issue for Egypt. So, what is the possible impact that can happen on Egypt from this dam? Uh, first of all, decreasing the resilience of the Egyptian High Aswan Dam, this one that's here. I'm just trying to be slow and trying also to be. Um, very uh, uh, simple in the description because of the audience. So uh, the resilience means that once you start filling the, the GERD, there will be a reduction in the volume of water in the high Aswan Dam, which means the resilience of the dam to face natural droughts in the future will be decreased. And that's, that's the main issue here, why filling the dam is an issue for Egypt causing water shortage and artificial drought for the downstream, natural drought when, the, when it's related to the hydrological cycle, artificial drought when you start filling the GERD, then you reduce the amount of water flowing to Sudan and, of course, reducing the amount of water flowing further to Egypt. So the dam safety is also associated with possible catastrophic impact on Sudan first, and then on Egypt second. So safety of the dam is one topic. Unilateralism, which means if Ethiopia decided to continue uh, filling the dam in a unilateral way with a lack of information communication, and we all heard and we read in the newspaper what happened in Sudan after the first filling, although it's a little amount, but it was done in one week and it had effect on the drinking water in Sudan, and the, the, the drinking water stations or water uh, plant were uh, shut down because there was a disturption of the flow coming to uh, Sudan. Um, the permanent reduction of hydropower at Had. So Had will be uh, 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 having less level, and less level means uh, less electricity. So the hydropower of the High Aswan Dam will be reduced permanently, so in the long run, uh, and increasing soil salinity. Increasing soil salinity, the less water you have, the more salt uh, uh, accumulating in the soil because there is no leaching to change the type of irrigation and, and, and without details, but we can go to the details if you need any clarification. The salt water intrusion, normally there is an interface between the Mediterranean Sea and the groundwater. So if you reduce the amount of water in irrigation, especially close to the north coast, of Egypt, then the groundwater is not charged. And the people continue pumping from the groundwater. So the groundwater level is depleted and the seawater is intruding or entering into the groundwater causing higher salinity. That's the phenomena that's called saltwater intrusion uh, that even any engineer knows what does it mean. Uh, degradation of water quality, of course, if you uh, uh, reduce the sediment uh, from uh, flowing to Sudan, for example, there will be reduction, enormous reduction of the silt. So the land will be less fertile. Sudanese will start using more and more fertilizers, which is going to affect the, the, the water quality in general in Sudan. And of course, the water flowing further to Egypt will have less quality. Decreasing surface water level, the more you regulate the, the dam, the river, the more, the less water level you will have because you will distribute 
the water so the Sudanese will have to bump and Egypt will have also to operate the water network at a lower level, which will have also another type of cost on the farmers. So the impact of shallow groundwater aquifer, because people will continue pumping more and more groundwater, and it's very well known that the groundwater in Egypt is non-renewable groundwater. Um, yeah, so all of this, in addition, I'm not going to tackle the environmental and socioeconomic aspects here, but just to give you one simple figure that is coming from one of the international studies, I can also um, send this reference to you. If, uh, or, or the, 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 this is coming from Deltaris, one of the international, uh, biggest international water consultant. So one reduction, the reduction of one billion cubic meter of water, we said Egypt is receiving 55.5 billion cubic meter. A reduction of only one billion cubic meter means for the Egyptians, 290,000 people will lose their income, 130 hectares of cultivated land will be lost, $150 million increase in importing food because you will not have the capacity of irrigating uh, uh, the agricultural land that's irrigated right now. Uh, $430 million US dollar of agriculture production. Uh, this will be the cost of only 1 uh, billion cubic meter reduction. Just to understand without any details or numbers, so, uh, imagine this is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the left side, and this is the High Aswan Dam. Of course, my Ethiopian brothers, they say, okay, you have a high level, you have big storage uh, in the dam. Yes, and this will help us to support the Grand Ethiopian Dam to be filled. Otherwise, there will be a disaster if you stop the water. The more water you store here, the less water will be flowing to the head because the Egyptians will continue uh, abstracting water from the head to supply their needs. So there will be a time that you reduce the flow to Sudan and Egypt enormously in order to fill the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. At the same time, you will reduce the volume of head. Of course, the, we never know. It's according to the hydrology. If you have wet here, the situation will be much better than what you see here. If you have an average, the situation will be average. But if you have dry years or prolonged dry years, then the situation in the hut will be dramatic. That's why you always hear in the discussion, in the news, drought, dry year, prolonged dry years. This is the period that the downstream countries uh, are concerning. So one, only there, just one figure to show you, this is the period between 19, uh, uh, 78 and, and uh, 2002 which was known as a period of drought. So if this filling started, this is the GERD level, and here is a high Aswan level on the right side. If you start filling the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam here, as you can see, up to the level of uh, 600, then 620, and 625, and then you start your operation between 625 and 640, as our Ethiopian brothers announcing, then this will be the impact, the blue line will be the impact on high Aswan Dam. There will be a dramatic reduction okay. in water okay. level, and you can reach here the shutdown. So okay. there is no water to supply the people in the downstream, and you saw already the impact of only one billion cubic meter. Here, the estimation of this simulation is 31 billion cubic meter of water distributed over this number of years of losses. So I think, I think that's a good point, Dr. Swelm. Well, thank you so much so that we could also hear from our uh, other uh, panelists who would uh, take the view of Ethiopia uh, so that we could uh, get to Q&A afterwards. So if we have Dr. Uh, Mogis, the, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Swelm, for, the, Swelm, for this uh, uh, very insightful and informative uh, presentation. Dr. Dr. Okay, Dr. thank you very much for uh, Institute of Water Politics uh, for organizing this important uh, panel discussion for not only for the region, but for Africa. This is one of uh, contested uh, issues in Africa. Uh, go ahead. 
uh, I have shared my uh, PowerPoint. I would like to, I didn't go into the details of uh, technicality, but I just want to touch base on general issues so that uh, people who are very technical can ask questions that uh, either in, in terms of modeling results or in terms of uh, any issue that uh, you think is technical or, or, or any issue. So I have organized it into four. It's Nile background. I think if there are some people who doesn't have more knowledge on Nile, I will I'll try to go into Nile background and then a little bit of the challenge because the challenge is related to not current, but the challenge is also future challenge in the Nile Basin. And then a little bit on Grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And uh, the solution, I say, has to be a big picture solution and a project based. Continue. Go ahead. OK, uh, as you can see from here, uh, the Nile, the Nile Basin is uh, a Nile, yeah, uh, from, uh, consists of Nile. 11 countries from Burundi to Egypt. And as you can see, 85% of the water is generated from Ethiopia and significant water is generated from Equatorial Nile, except that most of the water is sunk in, in, in the middle of Sudan. So uh, this is, if I show this hydrology, you can see the blue and this area is where the water is generated, source region. And these are use regions where in Egypt and Sudan, 90% of the irrigation uh, activity takes place. Uh, and in the South Sudan and uh, starting from Uganda, there are uh, cascades of lakes and swamps that uh, sink a lot of water, uh, almost 50% that's coming from, uh, from uh, this region. It means that now that significant water is pouring to the Nile Basin from Ethiopia, this is the main source region for all of us in Sudan, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Continue. Uh, I would like to pose a challenge. This, because Blue Nile is uh, one of uh, the biggest uh, volume contributor to the Nile, it's highly variable in terms of flow. You can see the average flow is 49 around, and you can see there is a lot of vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the flow coming from equatorial or white Nile. You can see uh, it, it is steady. That's the, the lower one you can see. Uh, and the blue Nile is the one that you can see is the biggest in the middle. It means that the four men's contribute almost 82% of the annual flow uh, from Ethiopia. This, that means of eight months of Ethiopia is also dry, like Egypt and, and, and Sudan. And much of the water is generated within four months. So that's why uh, storage is as important as Egypt and Sudan uh, because, of, uh, because of the mountain nature of the, the river, it rushes quickly into uh, the plains of Sudan and Egypt. Continue. And the next issue is population and economic growth. Grow, uh, economic growth is continuing in the region. You can see in 1970, around when High Aswan Dam is constructed, the population of the Nile Basin is close to 100 million. Uh, now it's close to 554 million, which means uh, the more agreements are delayed, the more uh, concluding agreements become uh, very complex. It would have been very easier if countries, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan would have an agreement 10 or 20 or 30 years than now. So this complexity of population and economic growth also impacts the water scarcity. Uh, as you can see, the water scarcity, my brother from uh, Egypt also showed, drastically increases. So we have to also take into account the population pressure coming from the source region of the water. Continue. And then the other is climate change. Climate change is one of the issues that also uh, is more unpredictable in the region. Even though many studies, including from MIT, shows there is a likely increase of uh, 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 volume of Nile 
over the coming uh, 100 years, but the frequency of flooding and drought would increase. That means this kind of big storage like GERD are very important to arrest both the drought situation and the flood situation. And it's also important uh, to put this kind of dams in a cool area where the evaporation is very low. Continue. Okay, another challenge is the hydropolitical challenge of these uh, colonial era agreements and past unilateral developments in Egypt and Sudan has resulted a little bit on Ethiopia. It, it impacted Ethiopia because Ethiopia cannot access development uh, funds from international uh, uh, funding organizations over the last five decades. So that has impacted in a way that Ethiopia has has developed the, the resource equally as other as as countries. So this is very important. Uh, and th th these countries has to move into a new regime of cooperation. Uh, and that's where uh, e equitable and equi uh, reasonable utilization of water resource uh, can guarantee sustainable development uh, in, in the Nile region. Continue. Now I will come, uh, already uh, many people know, GERD is located uh, in, in border to Sudan, as you can see, and this is a big dam, or the, the largest dam in, in, in Africa. And you can see uh, it's a smart dam in such a way that it has uh, different spillways. We have safety spillways, as you can see, three spillways here and here. Uh, we have also spillway here and it's only used for power as it stands, the design shows. So there is no any way that it, uh, it consumes water. It's only cons uh, the issue becomes a filling issue. During the filling issue, if it's done coordinately, uh, then the impact is believed to be a little uh, from uh, different studies. Continue. So why GERD, why is this recent dam is important? How, how did it, one is that Ethiopia is one of uh, countries with low, very low human development index. Uh, and, and if you go to UN development index charts, it's almost at the bottom of all, all countries. So uh, if you see electric consumption per, per a person, it's uh, World Bank shows it's close to six, 69 kilowatt hour per person, uh, whereas uh, other countries like Egypt is close more than 1,500 kilowatt hour per, per person. Even in sub-Saharan uh, standard of 500 kilowatt hour per capita, Ethiopia ranks one of the lowest. In the, so it, this is very important because electric consumption is a function of economic growth. Unless you have electric uh, consumption grown in a country, uh, it's very difficult to grow e economic situation in the country. The second is this project has been in planning for the last five decades, except that now that uh, it's larger, it's modified to accommodate the socioeconomic needs of, uh, of Ethiopia. And the other important why GERD is there was an attempt by uh, the three countries, Sudan, Egypt, and, and Ethiopia, to, to, to develop joint multipurpose projects uh, over uh, 2007, 2008, it was supported by World Bank and many partner organizations. That attempt was finally you know, declined by Egypt, and that also has created a little bit, uh, Ethiopia, had, Ethiopia and Egypt had a very high hope in this project. And uh, the CFA is also rejected. So all this combination has brought this dam into picture because the population of Ethiopia is growing uh, uh, drastically. Now we, we stand at 115 million. That's very important for country stability and economic growth. Continue. Uh, I would say the benefit is that it, it grows uh, per capita electric consumption of Ethiopia from current 69 to 220, even if it, it, we cannot reach into uh, that level of sub-Saharan, still we have to develop. And, and also uh, many studies show, I think it can add 
five to seven billion in economic opportunity, not only from electric generation, from the spin off economic opportunities. Uh, it reduces deforestation in the country. Uh, also, it, it provides a significant boost for education, health, and family planning in the region. Uh, at the same time, once GERD is in place, we know that uh, regional cooperation will kick in, integration will come, and it's very important for peace and security. Continue. What's the benefit for Sudan? You can see uh, if there was a renaissance dam today, we, Sudan wouldn't have suffered such flood disaster. Many, we lost many people in Sudan and uh, Egypt is also gearing uh, to accept all that flood and uh, they are prepared as, as we heard from news. So we can arrest floods. And at the same time, we, this is also a dam that's being built in a cool area in Ethiopia where it has system evaporation can decrease overall system by 1 billion, which means additional water, 1.1 billion cubic meter of water would be in the system. It uplifts uh, Sudan synergy without doing any additional development. As you can see, uh, it can benefit more than 200 million uh, USD per year, more than that, uh, depending on how you account those. Uh, reduced sedimentation to Sudan's dams and a lot of regional power connection in East Africa, Horn Africa, and it's vital for peace and stability in the region. Continue. Is there potential impact? I don't think there is any potential. Many scientific studies have shown there is little impact in water use in Sudan or in Egypt. Obviously, my brother in Egypt showed uh, the 1 billion reduction in flow, yeah, would affect that much people that, as he showed. But in effect, uh, Aswan is a very big dam. It, it, it holds twice the Nile flow, and it can arrest and it can use as a buffer. It can reduce the inflow to the Aswan, but it cannot reduce the water use because of the buffering effect, effect of highest one dam. I think if, if it is done properly, even it can arrest the prolonged drought occurs. We know that from, from uh, there was a prolonged drought in 1980s, and Aswan Dam has properly arrested that more than eight, seven years of drought. There is a chance uh, this dam has also a benefit to all of us in such a way that when filling takes place, has uh, has that advantage. At the same time, this is one of the wet years in the entire Nile, like Victoria is at high level, uh, Aswan is at high level, starting feeling this time would have a positive consequence for the coming two, three uh, years because of the memory of water in the system. Uh, continue. Uh, why is that then, if the, this, this dam is beneficial for the region, why there is stall, the negotiation is stalled? I think inherently there is a challenge between maintaining the status quo, the skewed water use status quo in the region, and uh, potential for future equitable and reasonable water utilization desire. That fatigue has to be solved, and I think we have to, in the region, we have to step up our collaboration to go into a new region, a new region of collaboration from the past colonial uh, regimes that we know. It's very difficult to, to get out of uh, what you have used uh, in the past, but I think uh, governments have to make a very bold decision in this way because it is what's at stake is not the governments, what's at stake is the people of Egypt, the people of Sudan, at the same time, the, the people of uh, Ethiopia. Continue. It's not, there is, we have achieved uh, over the last nine years since the launch of uh, uh, Renaissance Dam. I think there are also positive progress. When the countries, three countries, engaged 
without any mediators, they achieved to sign uh, the Declaration of Principles in 2015, which guides the whole process. Uh, at the same time, in 2018, there was a very, very productive process uh, between the National Independent Scientific Research Group that produced uh, a consensus report for the three uh, countries water ministers. That was almost nearly uh, to be signed. Uh, unfortunately, at the, at the last uh, stage, it was not signed uh, uh, because of uh, Egypt declined that. that. Uh, otherwise, it, it was one of uh, the beautiful examples that the three countries could achieve without even... Okay, okay. Uh, thank, 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 you, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. I think that's a good place to stop. That's what, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mogis, for your uh, very insightful uh, uh, presentation. And uh, oh, also Dr. Uh, I'll elaborate on. Yes, please. So we would have more opportunity in the Q and A, which is for the sake of time. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hani, the Ethiopian government recently banned any uh, flights over the uh, Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Does this signal a, a danger for military uh, conflict? That's likely. And also, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mogis, you can answer the question. So it's directed to both of you. And then I would. I'll ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to the, to the audience. So go ahead, please. Um, I have to, uh, to say that I'm a water engineer, so uh, I'm not the one, honestly, to speak about any military action or something. Egypt has announced clearly that the, 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 the water comes from these countries and there is a tight relation and brotherhood relation between them and go to the latest video of the president Sisi, he announced that uh, the people, crazy people speaking about war or attacks, this is nonsense because uh, there's only one way is negotiation and he stressed and repeated it a couple of times, the negotiations and the peace is the only way to solve the girl problem. But again, I'm a water engineer, so please keep me a water engineer till the end of the session. Thank you. I'll do so. Okay, how about you, Dr. Uh, Morgis? I think I concur with my brother, uh, Dr. Hani. Uh, I think it is beyond uh, our profession. However, these countries have been uh, bonded by nine, Sudan, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Hmm. And the w significant part of water comes from Ethiopia and other countries. And we have cultural ties. We have, uh, you know, uh, different ties. So. The option that uh, any country would go into war is jeopardizing that water is coming from upstream countries to downstream countries. So I don't think the governments would indulge in that activity. But of course, you can hear uh, news uh, media that, you know, inflames the situation. Uh, so I don't believe that would be the solution. It doesn't give a permanent solution. Well, let's hope so. Okay, maybe a question that you both can answer. Uh, you both alluded to the uh, importance of the water proportion for both Egypt, but also the harvesting and its importance for uh, for Ethiopia. Uh, Dr. Mogis has said that if this has been 15 to 20 in the past, it would have been resolved better. So, which means we're too late for resolving it. But anyways, Let's say in the future. So what do you both envision uh, a better way to distribute the water Nile uh, for these different uh, countries in terms of, uh, so that it doesn't make impacts on the climate change, but also that is equitable to downstream uh, uh, countries? Um, I, as an engineer, I, this, the solution is obvious. I mean, the simulation models and the, the analysis and the statistics and everything is showing that there is a solution. I have many comments on what my brother uh, said, I mean, uh, regarding the, the, the increase of the water in the region. It's absolutely not true. I mean, if you, if you build a dam with this amount and you have a storage capacity of as big as, as the city of London, there will be automatically increase in the evaporation unless you are believing to reduce 
the volume of high as one dam so that you can reduce the evaporation. If this is the idea, then as I said in my presentation, you are just putting the country in dangerous of suffering from drought because you are making the high as one dam useless. If you doesn't have the buffer that you mentioned many times, so there was a contradiction in the in the in the say one time it has a buffer of saving the Egyptians. On the other hand, you reduce the the evaporation and you increase the water resources. And this is for me as an engineer, it means directly reducing the volume stored in the uh, high Aswan dam. Back to the point, the solution is clear in the Egyptian proposals that has been have been put on the table and the latest one was pro, i mean mediated by the world bank and the, the us government and which is clear for the people that was negotiated in washington um, there was uh, an application for the international law that gives ethiopia the right to generate the maximum hydropower up to 80 percent in the worst case scenario to always generate the maximum hydropower and only reduction of 20% in the severe situation. When the downstream countries are suffering from drought, Ethiopia is only asking to reduce the hydropower generation by 20%. This is the optimum solution that okay. to reduce the downstream and again, Ethiopia's cave in the signing time. Okay, what, what do you say, Dr. Uh, Dr. Morgis, to this? Uh, statement by Dr. Hani that uh, Ethiopia could reduce it by 20% and that would have uh, less impact on the downstream countries. Uh, I, as I said uh, before, uh, the total volume, annual volume that reaches as one because of uh, uh, this Gerdi dam doesn't change in, in, in the, in, during the operation of the dam. It's only what we know is that it only uh, reduces before it was reaching within four and five months. Now it's distributed annually. What does it mean? It means high as one dam start operating at lower level, but the total volume remains the same. That amount. What does it make? It makes that then the the amount of water stored in the cool Ethiopia compensates more water because it's flowing annually. So evaporation in the hottest part of the world in Egypt would reduce because it is operating at lower level. In fact, the scoping studies before uh, that was supported by World Bank, if four consecutive dams was built in Ethiopia, uh, it says it reduces evaporation in Aswan, but it gets also steady flow of water annually instead of getting in four months. Uh, so I, I think uh, that's hydrologically contested and scientifically that's true. Uh, at the same time, it, Ethiopia gets significant amount of power uh, from its, its cool reservoirs. That's what I can say. Okay, so uh, someone, the two, one of you two mentioned that uh, the United States uh, involvement. So what can the United States do? I know the United States tried to mediate before uh, it delegated it to the African Union. By It was delegated by from the United Nations to the African Union so that they can resolve it. Now, what can the United States role be to help uh, Egypt reduce that uh, water evaporation or manage that water that it loses by 50% or so, depending on what the models are that you two are presenting clearly dif two different uh, uh, scenarios. So is there any role that the United States can play? I'm not sure which 50% you're speaking about, but... Okay. Uh, um, I'm talking about the fresh water. Yeah, um, after seeing the mediation and following closely the mediation of the World Bank and the US government and uh, over a very long time, after 10 years of independent negotiations between the countries, and then recently the involvement of the World Bank, I think they are very neutral, big international organization, and the US government, and reaching an agreement. And then, yeah, after the Egyptians and Sudanese sat in the flight, then they received the announcement in the last meeting that the Ethiopians are not coming. After finalizing the agreement, I don't know what else the US can do as a mediation role. 
If you're speaking about technically, um, I don't think there is something technical to be done on the Egyptian side right now, because all what Egypt is doing right now is trying to recycle the water one, two, three, four times in order to cover the needs. And now Egypt is lining about 40 to 50,000 uh, uh, kilometer of water uh, canals in order to see if any drop that might be uh, if, uh, see, um, deep percolated or seepage to the soil. So um, they're trying to do their best to optimize the usage of the available water. But if I go back to the point that my brother mentioned, uh, there are 2 billion cubic meters that will be lost as an evaporation from the GERD. If the Ethiopian brothers are going to operate the dams, their dams at a higher level during the entire year, which is not the case right now, there will be more evaporation happening in the system. So um, again, reducing the HAD level means less resilience and less safety and insurance for the Egyptians. So this is not the solution that we are looking for. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I chip in? Yes, please. And then I will open I it up to a one, of the, from the one, of the, one of the resolutions that uh, international partners like US would indulge is into, you don't find uh, a solution without the bigger picture seeing the bigger yeah. picture, holistic picture of integrated water resource management within the Nile system. Because we know there is more water in the Nile system than we are fighting. For example, uh, Egypt, uh, in, in one of the studies in Egypt, it showed to avert risk of GERD, if there is any risk, uh, agricultural management in Egypt alone can produce over 40 billion meter cube from the management. You have to make smart agricultural because that's inhospitable, hot rigid. And now we have to step out of that regime of, you know, wasting water, uh, even in Sudan, and come into a, a new regime of high water efficiency, uh, uh, selecting crops that utilizes less water. And smart agriculture, like many countries in the USA, in Israel, and other countries. So this is a study uh, from Egypt that says there is a chance that Egypt can save more than 40, uh, close to 40 billion cubic. That Ethiopia cannot utilize that much water if that is saved. So there is. It is only that we don't transparently talk. Egypt has one of uh, the oldest water stored in aquifers, like uh, like Nubian aquifers. I'm not saying it is, they have to- I, 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 I got your point, I got your point. So, but it seems like uh, Dr. Hani is not buying that. We can, uh, we can move on and uh, get some questions from the audience and that probably can bring more clarity. Uh, okay, so the first question is from uh, uh, Fiera Herba and it's, uh, both, it's addressed to both of you. It says the prof raises a good point that both countries face water scarcity. The question is that what are you proposing for a fair share of water resources to eliminate the scarcity? So uh, who wants to take that question, question and answer? Um, I, I, think, I think we need to distinguish between two main issues, solving sure. the GERD problem um, and uh, water allocation. Okay. So if we start to mix both of them, I think that we will make the problem very complicated. The mm -hmm. only needed thing from the countries right now is to be clear what is their objective of this negotiation is the objective of Ethiopia is generating hydropower? I personally doubt. If this is true, the proposals on the table are when solved. You, okay, uh, Dr. Dr. Swell, when you say you don't, what do you mean you don't? You don't buy the fact that they're trying to generate electricity? This is one of the objectives. Okay. The second and objective- what, what would be the other objective so that the audience might? Yeah, for, for me, for me, if, if I give you a, a solution to generate in all the times, 100% of the maximum capacity of your dam 
And only when you have the downstream countries, which may be three, four percent of the cases, um, that, that you, you reduce your amount of hydropower to 80 percent in a very, very few years in the history that might happen again, that you reduce your amount of electricity by 20 percent. I'm not saying on the long run. I'm saying only in a couple of drought years, severe drought years, and you're not accepting this, then I would think that the objective of this dam is controlling the water and controlling the Blue Nile and putting pressure on the downstream countries for whatever other reason. But so what do you propose? What, what do you propose as a solution? So that as a policy, if you were to recommend a policy prescription for resolving the issue? That we, we need to think about more collaboration, okay. more being, uh, uh, having okay. political will Okay. The, the, the proposals are there. As my colleague said, there are many publications putting solutions. Okay. Uh, I, I know some researchers in the U.S. who put I, like I, I, 20 I papers. Point. I understand. So, Let, let's, get the, uh, let's give Dr. Mogis also uh, an opportunity to answer. Yeah, I think the solution is not, as I said, it's not only uh, the GERD. It, it has to be holistic. One is there is already uh, the population in Ethiopia is staggeringly growing. It's becoming, you know, one of the lowest uh, human development index country. It's not only good to be, to to uh, to be frank. Ethiopia also wants to develop irrigation upstream of GERD. So, but but the issue been, right now is GERD. The issues at hand that we're discussing is GERD, and Egypt and Sudan are both uh, wanting to make sure that they get enough water. So, what do you? So, the question is saying. What do you propose as a fair way of sharing the water resource so that they can eliminate this scarcity of water that they, they have as a concern? I, I think the, the, these countries, the three countries, have already more or less technically agreed okay. uh, that filling would take place. The okay. filling numbers have been agreed, and what's remaining is operation. Uh, how do they operate? And we know that hydropower doesn't consume any water and operation shouldn't have been an issue. Okay, okay, okay. So we move on to the uh, next question. Uh, the next question is from uh, Michael Kamen and it, it stipulates that one effect of the GERD may be an increase in malarial uh, transmission to the population living near the reservoir. What is, the, what is Ethiopia doing to anticipate this problem? So I guess, uh, Dr. Uh, Mogis, you can answer. I think that's that's one of the mitigation measures that the Ethiopian government has to think about, uh, because obviously this kind of uh, issues would emerge. I haven't seen in the drawing board how they do it I'm in the United States, but I think that's important uh, question that has to be addressed by Ethiopia. Okay, Dr. Uh, Suelem, do you have any take on that? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of the situation okay. upstream of the GERD, but I just would like to correct something because of the audience. Uh, my colleague said that there is a research uh, uh, saying or giving the results that you, Egypt can save 40 billion cubic meter of water from the agriculture on my friend. Egypt is using 42, 43 billion cubic meter for agriculture. So if there is a research uh, uh, telling us to save 40, it means that we are not going to grow anything in Egypt and we are going to depend on importing food from Ethiopia. Maybe this is a proposal, but I don't see any technology as somebody who has 30 years of experience in irrigation and hydrology, any solution that can save uh, 95, 96% of, uh, of the water. I don't know this solution. Um, I can send you the paper. Yeah, please send it to me. But you know, there are many uh, Mickey Mouse papers online, so we need okay. to have okay. reliable research. Sure. So you two can exchange the uh, the notes later. Uh, for next question, which is uh, about the funding, I understand. So this is Michael coming again. He says I understand that funding for the GERD comes primarily from national sources of capital. Our Private investors pressuring the government to accelerate the, the filling, the, the filling rate to ac accelerate their returns on investment. Dr. Mogis? Uh, I, I don't think so, because already uh, negotiations 
in the pipeline. There are numbers already recommended, most like mostly accepted. Uh, so there is no uh, there is no pressure from the private or from uh, public, but we would stick. The, I think the government ha has to stick with uh, the negotiated negotiated outcomes that uh, Sudan and Egypt came technically. There are the, the only technically they have already declared 90% of the negotiation is almost agreed. So there are few things that they have to hammer. Uh, it, remaining is not a technical issue in my view. It's other related legal and uh, uh, related issues that's not solved yet. So in that case, Ethiopia you will go. This, so, um, thank you. Do you, do you agree uh, or disagree with this assertion that uh, pretty much things have been agreed on except with the exception of the legal uh, terminologies and legal uh, that's, technicalities? That's, uh, that's absolutely not true. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there is no agreement on the filling, as it was said. I mean, you can just Google and uh, read, and I'm following the file closely. There is no single agreement. We never heard about agreement for on the filling. There is no agreement on the filling. That's why Egypt announced that this is a unilateral action of starting filling without reaching agreement. And this is a violation of the signed declaration of principles that was signed in March 2015. So I am not aware so, of so, any uh, so, agreement on the filling. So Dr. Swellum and uh, Dr. Mogi, so that our audience can benefit from this. So what is the sticking point in the filling? Of read anything from four to seven years and otherwise. So what do you two say and what's the right uh, amount of years that the dam can be filled without harming the downstream countries? I start or? Yes, colleague? please. Uh, yeah, okay. go ahead. So um, the, the sticking point is, is, is very simple. I mean, at least for an engineer is very simple because uh, the Egypt is not uh, asking Ethiopia to commit to a certain number of years, Egypt is saying we are dependent on the hydrology. If we have wet years, you can take as much water as needed. If we have average year, you can have enough water to fill whatever the amount you want, whatever the table that Ethiopia proposing Egypt accept, accepted in this case. But please, in the drought and prolonged drought, let us make an action and decelerate the process of filling in a certain way. Uh, if you have a severe prolonged drought that extends over years, you need to take another measure. Ethiopia is asking that we sit and we discuss when we have this severe and prolonged drought and to shift it to something called the technical committee. And if you imagine 10 years, we are not reaching agreement on the filling that during the people suffering and dying, we are going to sit and discuss. And that's unacceptable for Egypt or Sudan. That's okay, I got it. So Dr. Mogis, please, what's your uh, answer on that? I, I think uh, we have heard from uh, the three countries, uh, they were close to agreement in, in filling. If in terms of drought, I would, I would see, especially this year, it's a, uh, one of the fortunate years of uh, uh, any years, uh, there is a huge water in the system. Uh, Aswan is operating at the highest level, Lake Victoria is at the highest level. So some of, you know, these drought conditions can be absorbed in the system. But the, what, when there is a prolonged drought comes, they have discussed, we will discuss and adjust accordingly. That's why, in the technical discussions, they said we would adjust accordingly. Okay. And, and there is a provision that says when this kind of situation occurs, we would adjust accordingly. There is already a provision. I no. don't. I don't see there is no any provision. Okay. Okay. Let sure. Let's uh, move on to the another question from uh, Berhano uh, Tai, uh, Tai, and he says desalination, uh, desalination uh, technology or desalination, uh, which means to, to remove the salt, right, uh, is now getting cheaper. Egypt has ultimate, uh, uh, unlimited access to Red Sea and Mediterranean Sea. Why can't Egypt use it, uh, its unlimited water resources in addition to conservation of available water by, by not using it for wasteful practices like growing uh, Alpha Alpha by uh, Galar Corporation? I guess, uh, Dr. 
Dr. Uh, why, why the U.S. is not desalinating water from the ocean uh, as much as you want? Why the Gulf countries are not desalinating water as much as they want? Because it's expensive. Because you pay for each cubic meter. I'm speaking about cubic meter. Okay. And you, the person who's asking, and me, uh, we need 1,000 cubic meter per year minimum. This is a property line. So you need between 0.5 dollar and 1 dollar per cubic meter. So if you are going to cut from the river uh, Nile 1 billion that I mentioned uh, before, which is uh, the best case scenario, GERD will cut more than 1 billion. This is 1 billion dollar per year, just to give you a clear answer. This will cost the desalination of 1 billion year with all the consequences with okay. all the uh, environmental huge impact of desalination. Understood. Desalination is not a sustainable technology. Understood. So it's expensive and not sustainable. Understood. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Mogis? Otherwise, we'll move to the next question. Uh, excuse me. There is one thing I forgot I have to mention. Uh, in terms of prolonged drought, that the discussion was, uh, uh, is that uh, why should Ethiopia uh, share the burden of drought, prolonged drought, and there was a succinct, clear response uh, from the government of Ethiopia saying drought should be shared. Ethiopia has a drought occurrence distributed all over the watershed. But when drought comes, we have to share, we have to take shared responsibility between Sudan, Ethiopia, and, and Egypt. That was one of the issues that raised. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from uh, Stevanos Abebe, and his question is to both of you. And he's saying, he's asking how much groundwater reserves in, is in Egypt? And do you think the hydrolog uh, hydrological data of the Nile Basin is recorded correctly? So Dr. Uh, Dr. Hani, why don't you take that question? Yeah, um, the, the groundwater in Egypt is it's very clear and obvious that there is a groundwater in Egypt in the uh, European aquifer. Uh, there is a debate about the amount of this water, and uh, you need to think uh, that this water is non-renewable, and I don't know a study that said that this is renewable water, Almost all the studies I know, they said it's non-renewable. And non-renewable means you have a reservoir. Every single cubic meter you take it from, this reservoir is lost. So there is no uh, recharge of this aquifer. So you have to be careful of the amount of water you bump from this. And it's very clear for the Egyptians that in the areas when they started over bumping in the last 10, only 10 to 20 years, there is a huge type of problems happening. Like if you travel between Cairo and Alexandria, you will see the groundwater after it was wonderful and you can drink it. Now the salinity of this groundwater is reaching 2,000 parts per million so that the people pumping groundwater and desalinating it, so adding money. So we have to be careful when we speak about groundwater in Egypt because it's non-renewable and over pumping is happening. Unfortunately, we cannot avoid it because there is a water scarcity. And there is a there is a, 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 a huge impact on the quality of the water and its amount as well. So you making the climate uh, climate or environment uh, argument there? Is it uh, is it uh, you coming from a climate change uh, argument that is not renewable? Or what's the uh, point? No, uh, the, the 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 renewable uh, groundwater is normally comes uh, normally comes from the rainfall. Right. So at a certain time of the history, there was rainfall in this area of the desert that recharged the aquifer. And then this rainfall, because of changing the pattern, the rainfall pattern has been changing in the area. So it's becoming a desert. Um, I think before it was not a desert, but now it's a desert. And this water is still under the ground. Understood. OK, so uh, can I add a little bit? Yes, please go ahead, Doctor. I, I think uh, Doctor Hani is is right. This is non-renewable aquifer. Uh, I'm glad but, we finally have an agreement. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is non-renewable. Yeah. Uh, but the amount of water stored in the non-renewable aquifer is so significant that if you utilize a couple of one hundred meters of water, it it many studies shows there is close to 14,000 billion of meter cube. It doesn't mean that Egypt has to utilize all of that, but for the sake of the region, 
there is a chance that they can also utilize that water because our population will not increase infinitely. After 2050, we, 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 we come to the, the closing of rate of increase of population. Population starts becoming steady. Then sustainable utilization of water resource come. But until then, Ethiopia development means population reduction. We cannot keep Ethiopia and others without developing. So we have to come into a common solution. In that common solution, some aquifer water could come into picture. Water efficiency, utilization of water come into picture. In that way, as a region, we can develop a sustainable, a sustainable regime within within the nine raising cuts. That's what I mean. Thank you. OK. So this is the proposition. Yeah, go quickly, please. Uh, yeah, allow me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Um, it's just, just giving the impression that Egypt is not using groundwater and keep it in the bank. Um, so that's not true. That's not true. All the desert projects, except minor issues, are based on groundwater. When you fly over Egypt, what you see all these uh, central pivot, everything that you see in the desert is groundwater. So it's not that Egypt is not using it. And I was saying that it's what not, it's even overusing it. So I would, as a, somebody who cares about sustainability, advise the government to use it less. But what's happening now is over bumping and overusing. So I don't know from where the idea came that Egypt is not using back, uh, groundwater. About the quantity of the available groundwater, there is a huge debate. I can also show you studies giving completely different figures, and there is no figure that you can say this is the right one. There are many various numbers existing in the literature. So. Thank you. It seems like it's clear that there are different models and uh, uh, scenarios as far as the impacts. And so I'm glad to hear that there's different scenarios. So definitely do share the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the paper or the statistics you have in a later session or in, in an email format so people, the audience could uh, benefit. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, that uh, Michael again, it's, uh, Michael Kamen is asking, I can understand uh, Dr. Ha uh, Dr. Hani's concern regarding the political leverage that Ethiopia will gain. Maybe, maybe a tri-national commission to manage the dam might work. Yes or no? Yes, uh, Egypt proposed that the three countries, because Egypt and Sudan are doing this, and it's very well known in practice in the uh, international community that when you have a shared river and you have a set of dams, you manage them together. Huh? Okay. Ethiopia refused completely this type of discussion, although mm -hmm. the agreement between Egypt and Sudan, it, there are Egyptians in Sudan controlling the operation of the dams, and there are Sudanese in Egypt working with the Egyptians on High Aswan Dam. This is very well known and very acceptable, but Ethiopia refusing any other nationality to come to the Ethiopian land and share and contribute in operating or managing the okay. earth. Dr. Mugis, can, can, thank you. Dr. Mugis, can you answer as to why this uh, proposition of having a tri commission that could manage the, uh, can manage would not work and why Ethiopia has reservation? Uh, Ethiopia's, I think Ethiopia's reservation is not completely uh, ignoring the the joint uh, operation, but what uh, important point Ethiopia raises is that there has to be a legal framework, legal regime that first have to be developed within within the, the region, either within the three countries or uh, within the Nile. There ha there has never been it, Nile Basin is one of the basins without any comprehensive legal region in the world. There is no legal region. So we have to have a legal. I understand Sudan and Egypt has their bilateral legal regime. That's fine. But as far as Ethiopia is concerned, as, as far as Nile is concerned, there is no. I think it should, uh, the audience should also understand that it is probably one of the few large reserve. Uh, river basins without legal regime and it's also one of uh, river basins whereby the downstream countries uh, legally shared 100% of the Nile. So that situation is where 
uh, Ethiopia is uncomfortable. I think stepping into the next level, all of us together, would obviously uh, bring, because in the CFA it says uh, the Nile has to be managed by independent line, Nile Commission, not Egypt, not Ethiopia, not Sudan or Uganda. It has, there has to be a, an independent commission. Sure. So that so kind of arrangement yeah. entices Ethiopia. I got the point. So Dr. Uh, Suelem, what do you think the independent commission <coughs> that is not Egypt or Ethiopia, nor Sudan managing this? Oh, uh, unmute yourself, we can hear you. We need to distinguish between the, the, uh, the Nile Basin and the Blue Nile Basin. There are two sure. issues here. We sure. are here and they are there negotiating and discussing, discussing the Blue Nile and the Blue Nile is only about three countries. So when we speak about commission, we are speaking about commission of the three countries. But please Google, Google it and see the, the official announcements of the, uh, uh, the the minister, Ethiopian minister of international affairs, the Ethiopian minister of water resources, that managing the dam and operating the dam is an issue of Ethiopian sovereignty. So there is no one can come from outside to manage the dam. It's not me who is saying that, but okay. please go to the record videos and official statements. Okay, okay. So let, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Lul Zekt uh, Abebe is asking, it should be clear that USA and World Bank are not mediators, but observers. Ethiopia has not, uh, has not consented to that role of the two. Does Egypt have the political will for collaboration? Most of the farms along the Nile Valley are, are foreign owned and designed for export and supply, uh, and supply the region. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hani. Um, so the role I don't of the know US who, and decided, who decided about observers or uh, mediation, but please go to the declaration of principle. I think the, the item number 10 is saying if the three countries cannot reach or the three uh, parties cannot reach an agreement, they can ask for mediation. And that's exactly what happened. They went to the World Bank. Ethiopia agreed. Why Ethiopia sat for six months meetings in Washington, meeting in Ethiopia, Khartoum, Cairo, Cairo, Ethiopia, Khartoum, then Washington, 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 three, four meetings in Washington, and then they discovered what at the time of signing that uh, the World Bank and the U.S. should not play a mediation role. Come on. I mean, uh, uh, Egypt signed this agreement from one side, initiated it to show the interest of reaching an agreement. But again, while the people, the negotiation teams from Egypt and Sudan sat in the flight, they were informed that the Ethiopians are not coming to the last meeting. Um, we just, uh, so what happened? Is Ethiopia not willing to uh, sit down at the negotiation table? Yeah, I think the Washington discussions, the last discussion whereby uh, the USA and the World Bank came as a mediator mm -hmm. and produced a new set of uh, agreement that Ethiopia shocked, Ethiopia was shocked. It, it says if there is a drought, if there is prolonged drought, if there is prolonged dry years, Ethiopia should supply additional water from its reservoir. It, that, that's a, it means implicitly, Ethiopia understood, this is to maintain that status quo currently existing. Anything instead of saying because before in January 31, the means it says in, in this declaration, it says the ministers agreed to, sh to, 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 to bear the responsibility of drought sharing. It is a shared responsibility. Now the whole burden came to Ethiopia and that's why Ethiopia said, no, how, how, how comes I should supply? That, what does it mean? It means that the reservoir starts operating at a lower level, what does it mean? It means that if Sudan and Egypt uh, relies on Ethiopia's power, it means that it adds another penalty because Ethiopia should not, it's, it's, not, it's not like you have to release all the time when the drought comes. Without the dam, even uh, Egypt and Sudan has, has overcome 
uh, the drought such situation without the dam. So what if Ethiopia says, I will release all incoming flow from the, the Blue Nile, like it used to be. Instead, okay. Ethiopia, in fact, said, okay, I will add more water and release during the drought and sure. uh, prolonged drought. I, I think you made your point, uh, Dr. Mugis. I see uh, Dr. Uh, Hani is smiling. Please go ahead. No, because uh, because I'm, I'm have, of course, all respected. It's not in it's a positive sense. It's not in a negative way. Uh, but what what I would like to say here um, that the the uh, when you speak about adding a certain storage to the system of an added value to the downstream countries, what we hear all the time, what does it mean for the audience adding values? That you have a bank of storing water in the upstream because you mentioned before the dam, before the dam, this seventy four billion that you are storing in Ethiopia were in high Aswan dam. Now you talk them from the system to store them in Ethiopia, which is okay. Egypt is saying no one in Egypt is uh, forbidding the right of the Ethiopians for the development and uh, uh, reducing hydropower. This is acceptable for everyone on earth, uh, for me and for every Egyptian as well. So, but at the time of water scarcity, and you see people in the downstream who lost 74 billion to be stored in Ethiopia, and you see them in the prolonged drought suffering from the water shortage because the situation after the dam is not the same like the 80s, for many reasons. First, there is a 74 billion or 50 or 60, depends about the storage at that time when it happened in the future. Second, the Ethiopian population has increased. So in the 80s, Ethiopia, uh, sorry, the Sudanese population has increased. So Sudan is abstracting today much more water than the 80s. So all of that you have to consider it. And if you have this water stored in Ethiopia and the people suffering in the downstream and you are asked to release water, you know that releasing the water from the dam will also generate energy because the water will have to go through the turbines and generate hydropower. So you are not even losing anything. We are just asking you, and instead of releasing it after a couple of months, please release it now because people dying in the downstream. That's the entire point about it. But you are going to generate an energy with this water. Okay, so it seems like... Uh, can, Dr. Can, can I intervene a little bit? Yes, this? very, very briefly, so we can move on yeah, to the I next think question. It's, it's misleading, storing 74. It's that 74. So what's the correct one? It go, it's distributed annually and it flows downstream. It, Instead of going in four or five, three months, now it's annually distributed and going. Now, what Ethiopia says is, I will release the water, but it has to be according to my power generation rules. But it's not because you requested. If that is the reason, why is that? Dr. Hani, can you advise the Egyptian government? Okay, this is the situation. Many studies have shown that in case of this, because there is also practice in Egypt that during drought season, Egypt implements drought mitigation policy. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. You have from 5 to 15, you reduce. But instead of that, you can add more. Okay, let's modernize our agriculture. Let's yes. support yes. Ethiopians by yes. modernizing agriculture. You, in Egypt, you know how rice is being so uh, being cultivated. How yeah. so, uh, the Dr. most water consuming sugar Dr. cane is Dr. You know, Mobis. Uh, so all of this can can come into picture for the sake of fraternity, for the sake of brotherhood. Okay, we'll do this, you do this. That should come okay. into that's what we call shared management of drought. Okay, yeah. sure. It seems like we have agreement on the shared uh, at least uh, sentiment that Ethiopia has to have, um, uh, Dr. Han is saying that Ethiopia is definitely entitled to the generation of electricity and, um, and, and for development. So that's good, that's good. So, but you also agree that the, the, the water need to flow well, at least they need to get as equal or not less water so that they're not harmed in the downstream countries. But also this is a good segue to get into what are the other countries' uh, positions? Because uh, we have the basin, but we also have other countries. Uh, we have Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, Eritrea, and South Sudan, and uh, Tanzania, Uganda. So, and, and the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. What is their position on this? And this is directed to both of you. 
uh, is it me? Well, yeah, you can go ahead if you're ready. I, I, I don't have, I cannot give you a direct oh, answer, but sure. I can speculate. Sure. As uh, uh, the power generated in, in, uh, in GERD would obviously be uh, regional also available for regional market. Okay. And uh, I think that would entice the, the region. Uh, and I see some of the countries like uh, Uganda uh, saying, yeah, it, it, we support Ethiopia's uh, development. I don't see a statement coming from, uh, as, I mean, you cannot say that all countries gang up and say, okay, let's do. But I, I think there are signs that uh, countries are interested to buy power from Ethiopia. And Kenya, uh, there is transmission going up to Kenya. Uh, there is transmission, uh, of course, obviously in Sudan and Djibouti. So uh, I think what I would say, I, I just speculate that uh, GERD would be very uh, important for the region. Okay, thank you. How about you, Dr. Uh, Hannes Wellem? Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, interested to know um, we start always to hear from our brothers and friends in Ethiopia that a uh, big portion of the population, they don't have electricity. And once we start speaking about uh, the Nile Basin, then we feel that the GERD with, uh, with the minimum number of uh, uh, actual hydropower that will be generated will be distributed to Kenya and Uganda and Sudan and maybe to Egypt. So I don't know how this will mathematically calculate it. Are you going to use the hydropower for the poor people who don't have electricity and still using wood for cooking or you are going to export it and sell it to other countries? This is something. Although, and you all know, uh, especially the technical people, you know that the GERD was announced to have the capacity of 6,000 and I doubt that it's going to produce two point something. So it might not be producing the, 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 the uh, less than 30% of the announced number. Back to the uh, African other night basing countries, I don't think there is a, there is a, uh, there is a relation uh, between them and the GERD, as I said, because this is the Blue Nile, but Egypt also has a great relation with the country. Egypt is contributing now in building uh, uh, a dam in Tanzania. So Egypt is not against building dams in the Nile countries. Uh, Egypt is just asking to coordinate in order to survive, to, to keep the life of the people and to keep the resilience of the Egyptians. But Egypt building, so if you has a history of building dams and supporting and funding also dams in other countries like Uganda, like South Sudan, like Kenya, like Congo, like uh, like like other uh, countries, Tanzania, as I said. So I don't see any okay. problem with the other countries. Sure, I got your point. So uh, from Berhano at Tai, uh, on that same point, he's saying, Dr. S uh, Suelem, tell us what the water share of Ethiopia and Sudan should be. And the colonial share is no more sustainable. I think he's referring to the colonial uh, agreement. I believe this is a 1959 agreement. So what would you say to that? I don't know any agreement called colonial. I know the agreement of 1959, which is okay. uh, between Egypt and Sudan. But if you speak about water share, then this is another platform. The, the other platform, because you need to consider that uh, the, the Ethiopia is receiving more than 900 billion cubic meter of water, and now we are negotiating and uh, uh, debating about 49 flowing from the Blue Nile. So I would also say, if you start calculating the water share, I'm not sure whether Ethiopia is going to get any water from the Blue Nile in an engineering way of the amount of uh, 40 billion cubic meter renewable groundwater are in Ethiopia, not non-renewable, speaking about 900 billion cubic meter rainfall, speaking about uh, uh, other uh, rivers in the country. So I'm not sure, uh, yeah. Dr. One day, Hani, one day, sure. one day sure. this exercise will have to yeah. be. Can I say, yes, I think please. you want to yes. steal we're, some water from God. We're running out of God. time, so please briefly, yeah. yes, we're running out yeah. of time. So Do we... you want to steal some water from God? I mean, uh, the, 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 that much rainfall is available for evaporation. Uh, come on. You cannot on. avoid evaporation, one. Second, most of rainfall falls in Ethiopia in mountains, unless you can arrest 
how can it's it's for Ethiopia owns sixty percent of the mountains of Africa, and most of the flow occurs in mountains. Okay, we can arrest even if we arrest the whole water from rain. It also have atmospheric demands that it takes it back. Otherwise, it is very difficult to get even the next rainfall without evaporation feeding the uh, the atmosphere. So I, I think 900 is completely a false statement that misleads the the, 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 the audience. So that's okay. that's no, Dr. 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 Uh, to follow up on that. Uh, Dr. Give Dr. some examples if you allow me. Sure. Uh, you, you, the audience, you, how what you do with the 900? Yes, just for the sake of time, Dr. Suellam, uh, uh, this next uh, question is from an anonymous attendee. He's asking or she, uh, could the panelists elaborate on environmental degradation, water misuse, and water pollution, particularly in Egypt? I think you alluded to the underground earlier. So can you elaborate more from a perspective of the environmental uh, impact? Um, just if you give me 10 seconds to comment on the last issue. Sure. Of, go ahead, go ahead. Most of, the, most of the agriculture in Ethiopia is rain fed. So rain is not only for evaporation, rain is for also food production. And Ethiopia is the second, uh, is, is the one of the 10 global exporters of organic food. Ethiopia is the second globally of exporting uh, uh, um, coffee, and you know that. Ethiopia is exporting uh, uh, sugar, key, uh, biofuel. So all of that is coming from the rain, my friend. It's not only rain for evaporation, rain for food, rain for animal. Ethiopia is producing more than 100 million heads of animals, livestock every year. All of that is from the rain. So please don't tell me that the rain is useless. The other point about the environmental degradation, of course, any dam, even highest one dam, I'm not excluding it, has huge environmental impacts. So if my colleagues are saying that the sedimentation is going to be stopped and the, the Sudan will benefit from less sedimentation, Sudan will suffer from the water, from the soil fertility, and Sudan will start using fertilizers in a very intensive way to, uh, to, uh, to keep the land uh, fertile. So uh, the, the salinity of the water is going to increase. The uh, biology of the water is going to be changing. The seawater in the North Mediter in the Mediterranean Sea is going to interfere with the groundwater in Egypt. As I mentioned before, the, sea, uh, the salt water intrusion uh, uh, phenomena that it's known, uh, soil will be saline in the delta. Um, it might affect the, the, the relation between the delta area and the sea. So there are many other uh, environmental impact that are known, ecological impact of any big dam of this size. Okay, very, very quick question, and this is again uh, on that same topic, uh, and then I'll allow you to respond. Uh, Kwane Faseha is asking, my question is to both speakers, is it fair for Egypt transferring Nile waters across the canal to Israel? Egypt is also allowing other countries to invest in farming Egyptian desert by leasing the land to others while opposing the development of Africans in the basins. Is this fair for Africans? Why don't you go, uh, Dr. Uh, Mujis, and then you can follow up. Uh, uh, allow me, please, to comment on the previous issue. Sure, uh, please, uh, five uh, seconds. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is only to, over the last hundred years, it's only Ethiopia who had catastrophic drought disasters. If there was that amount of rainfall available, where, where is the food? I'm telling you, this rain is available. It's only three months. And that, you know, as a hydrologist, I know as a hydrologist, Blue Nile rainfall is one of the highest variable rainfall. And what, what it means is that we need to enhance our storage capacity. To, if we were, Ethiopia is not exporter of food. Ethiopia is the net importer of food. Anyway, uh, I think, all dams uh, have uh, coming back to the uh, environmental impact. I think all big dams would have environmental impact, but most important part is it has to be managed. It has to be uh, monitored. Uh, it, I think that's that's what I can say. So if, uh, if you want me to comment on the question, um, I don't know from where this information is coming from. Egypt did not transport any water to Israel. 
Egypt has uh, uh, transported water to Sinai, and Sinai is part of the Egyptian land. The, the uh, Suez Canal that's separating this land from the Delta or from Egypt, uh, from, from the Delta area, so from the east, from the, south, from the west, this is an artificial canal that the Egyptians built. Even if on the, on the map, it looks like separating, but the water is flowing under the Suez Canal using what we call siphons, going to uh, Sinai for bringing life to the people over there. And for your information, this is a recycled water. There is a huge uh, uh, water treatment station at the head of this uh, canal to treat the water that's coming from uh, wastewater. So please don't give uh, uh, information that are not correct, that there is no water transported to any other country. And all the Egyptian projects in the country are for the development of the Egyptians as the same. You have to accept that, like what we are accepting GERD for development purpose only, not for political one. Uh, you are muted. Uh, you want me to talk? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, I have no knowledge of uh, Egypt transferring uh, water to Israel. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, that's not up to us, me and uh, Dr. Hani. Uh, probably governments know, uh, but what is striking is that the ground, my friend. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. No, I mean, but one one fact is true that the Sinai water and there is also another water transfer out of the basin, out of the Nile basin. There is Toshka canal that takes water to the, the most inhospitable part of Egypt. Uh, through uh, pump, uh, Mubarak pump, and there is also it's not it's this Sina is not only uh, Dr. Han. It's not only uh, recycled water. It's a, it's most of it is from Nile. We know it. I have visited myself. There is part of it is recycled water. So there is component of transferring wa water out of the basin. So I think this is not helpful to uh, cooperation. Also, you, you know, getting water out of uh, the basin. Uh, even, you know, uh, you when such kind of activities takes place, it's also uh, important to notify countries uh, and and can't, that's what also triggers countries. The water is going, the, the question that uh, it goes to Israel probably comes when you see the, the line, it goes very close to Israel. Thank you. Okay. Israel has borders with Egypt, so you are, you are free to do whatever you want in your land. I mean, Ethiopia is also developing dams. Ethiopia is building. Gerd is not the first one. I mean, Ethiopia is building other dams or also contributing, uh, having irrigation canals on the Blue Nile. So uh, I don't know if you start extending one of the canals here or there or from Lake Tana to any direction. Is this taking water out of the, of the basin? I don't think so. As much as the water is still inside your borders, then it is uh, not outside the basin. So I honestly don't know what's your definition for basin. Basin is a basin. So that's 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 a clear uh, definition. I think, for example, if, if in, in Ethiopia, if you transfer a huge amount of water, there are uh, studies, you know, research studies transferring water from Blue Nile to other basins, like Awash basins. Basin okay. transfer means that. And in Egypt, out of the basin, uh, a certain amount of water is transferred from the line of the catchment or the basin. That's what I mean. All so the, that's all not... The, all the Egyptian... That, that, okay. Okay. Was, uh, okay. Okay. So um, what is the way out? What is the way out of this uh, uh, conflict between the two countries and and please go ahead, Dr. Morgis. What do you think Ethiopia um, as a country, I know Ethiopia has a sovereignty and also has a right to generate electricity for development otherwise, but also the Egypt is very clear evidently and Sudan as well, that they have the right for having enough water. So what do you think is a fair um, 
policy solution for this impasse and what also the African Union has the, the uh, capability to resolve this peacefully? Yeah, I would say this. I, I, I think this uh, issue will continue for the coming hundred years unless a holistic solu solution comes into picture. Okay. What is that holistic? One is that if countries cannot agree with projects like GERD, then uh, the three countries should should st step up into water sharing negotiation, okay. okay. long-term water sharing negotiation. Uh, in that in that case, what happens is you can establish a legal regime based on the legal regime. Ethiopia will, will have operates because once you have a legal regime, you will have also institutional mechanism uh, for Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan. So that's very important. Now, in the short term, uh, I think what's essential is uh, the three countries agree in the feeling phase. It is the feeling is coming quickly. Last one, the first one passed, and the next two. One comes and then comes. So they have to agree in the feeling that builds confidence for the next movement. Will not be separated. But this negotiation will continue. Okay, thank you. That's, that's okay, uh, Dr. Swalm, and then we will uh, end up because we're over time almost by 10 minutes. Okay, um, I, I totally, uh, sorry for at the end, disagree with, the, with entering discussion into water sharing because simply, uh, water sharing discussion at this point, when you start unilaterally filling, is a violation of the declaration of principles that the three countries signed in March 2015, which is saying the three countries have to agree on the filling and the operation of the GERD under specific conditions. This agreement within months, and now we are five years, we did not reach any agreement, even if it was said that there is an agreement on filling, there is no single agreement on any word till now, and there is a unilateral action of starting filling, violating the declaration of principle, bringing water sharing, as I hear from every source now coming from our brothers, it means um, just trying to escape from the DOB and bring new topics on the table that are not signed in the declaration of principles, what is signed in the declaration of principles that needs to be applied. And I think the three countries, they need strong mediation, with the strong people technically and legally so that they can okay. help them to solve the problem. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can I add one minute? Uh, not one minute, but uh, yes, please, because yeah. we're out of time. So, yeah, go ahead. Go I ahead. Think, Briefly, please. Yeah, it's, Briefly. it's very important. The three countries also uh, depend on DOP. DOP is the, the, the guiding principle. In the DOP, what it says is the dam would be filled as it's constructed. That's what it says. So the dam is now being constructed and it is being filled. That's where the next phases has to be filled and then they have to start agreement. It's I not have, out of the scope I, of the DOP. I have completely different interpretation and oh. I think there okay. is a different interpretation for sure. this. Dr. Dr. Swell, uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, for our audience, they, as you can see, this is a very contentious issue. So I uh, thank my uh, two, great uh, panelists with the depth and expertise of these modelings and uh, the discussion will continue uh, online. So feel free to send them your questions. Uh, there are still more questions to be answered, but I wish we had uh, more time to do so. But uh, let join me please in thanking uh, these two great uh, panelists. And with that, I would like to conclude uh, this session. Uh, and before I conclude, I would like to thank our host, the Institute of World Politics, and I would also thank you as uh, audience for uh, bringing all these questions and for being patient for this uh, uh, session. And with that, I will uh, say a uh, good, uh, good evening, uh, wherever you are, good afternoon and uh, stay blessed. And thank you so much. And please join us uh, in future events of this uh, series on the African Strategic Forum. And uh, I'm your host, uh, Hashim Maki, and thank you uh, and stay well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for inviting us. You're welcome. Thank you so much.